Picture this. Your job is laying transatlantic telephone cable on the seabed. This job means that you have to climb into a submersible where you barely fit before you descended to a depth of 1600 feet. Once down there, you spend 8 hours working on laying the telephone cable in the darkness of the ocean. Once that shift is over, you, alongside your coworker, are now being pulled up to the surface. It's all routine until it isn't. Because something goes wrong. Horribly wrong. The rope that is pulling you up now snaps and you are falling to the bottom of the ocean. It's black, cold and wet and you are in a submersible with limited oxygen. There is nothing you can do but wait and hope that you will be rescued in time. This is the story of the Pisces 3 accident. Built by Heiko International Hydrodynamics of North Vancouver in British Columbia, Canada, the Pisces class submersibles are three-person research deep submergence vehicles. They had an operating depth of 2,000 meters, which is roughly 6,500 feet. The submersibles have multiple viewports and sample collecting, environmental sensing and instrument placement capabilities. The Pisces submersibles were a representative of crude submersibles that were built in the late 1960s and became workhorses in offshore exploration and oceanographic research. The first production model of this design was the Pisces II, which was completed in 1968. In the year after, 1969, the Pisces III launched. This submersible measured 20 feet long by 7 feet wide by 11 feet high. The design was roughly the same as the Pisces II, the Pisces III originally had tail fins, which would later be removed to improve access and handling, which would turn out to be a mistake. During the early hours of the 29th of August 1973, the pilots Roger Chapman and engineer and senior pilot Roger Mallison commenced a routine dive they were working on laying transatlantic telephone cable on the seabed 150 miles southwest of Cork, Ireland. The dive would take about 40 minutes before they reached their destination and embarked on an 8-hour shift within this submersible. During this shift, the submersible would go along the surface of the seabed at half a mile an hour where they worked on laying the cable. It was a tiring job, where both men had to maintain concentration at all times, in a very tight and uncomfortable space. For Mallison, the dive was even more tiring, because he had spent the previous day repairing a broken manipulator on the submersible, which meant that he had gone almost 26 hours without sleep. During this repair, Mallison also decided to change the oxygen tank for a full one. There was nothing wrong with the previous tank, but Mallison figured that as he was already working on the submersible, he might as well just change the tank as well. This will be important later. Shortly after 9 a.m., Mallison and Chapman had just completed another shift and was about to be lifted back onto the mothership when there was suddenly a water alarm. The reason for the alarms was that the tow line which was lifting the submersible had gotten tangled and wrenched the hatch open. This part of the submersible was a self-contained part of the submersible, which contained machinery and oil storage. While this was in a different compartment, the men that was inside the other compartment could hear the water rushing in and it didn't take long before the aft compartment was fully flooded. This led to the submersible becoming inverted and beginning to sink. 
For the men inside, this all happened very fast. One minute they were waiting for a tow line to be attached to lift them and then take them back to the mothership. The next, they were hurtled backwards and then sinking rapidly. The submersible kept sinking until it reached 175 feet, which was the maximum length of the nylon tow line. Now they found themselves suspended by the tow line and could feel the submersible swinging about in the sea currents. But then the rope snapped. Now they were free falling to the bottom. Thinking quickly, the pilots shut off all of the electrical systems, which left the sub in total darkness. During the descent, they also dropped a lead weight to make the sub lighter as they descended. They then quickly moved to grab cushions and curling themselves up as much as they could to try and brace for impact. They also grabbed some cloth that they placed in their mouths to avoid biting their tongues off when the sub slammed into the bottom at around 9.30 am. Fortunately for Mallison and Chapman, they were still in contact with the ship above. So at around 9.45 am, they made telephone contact with the ship and let the crew know that they were both fine, morale was still good, and they were getting organized. This meant that Mallison and Chapman spent the first few hours rearranging everything in the sub as it was almost upside down at this point. They mended as much as they could and they made sure that there were no leaks. They also knew that they had to preserve as much oxygen as they possibly could. And they did this by moving as little as possible, not even speaking to each other. After thoroughly checking everything, they now knew that there was nothing immediate that they had to deal with. They climbed as high up in the sub as they possibly could and got as comfortable as they possibly could. Again, they knew that they had to preserve as much oxygen as possible, so they remained still and didn't speak to each other. But they would grab the other's hand, giving it a squeeze to let the other man know that they were still there and they were still alright. The oxygen tank had a capacity to last approximately 72 hours, but after an 8 day shift, there was 64 to 63 hours remaining. No lights were on, they had been using flashlights to check everything in the sub, so it was completely dark. It was cold, and all they could do at this point was wait. On the surface, the rescue effort was already well on the way. A support ship, Wicker's Venturer, which at the time was in the North Sea, was ordered to return to the nearest port with the other submersible, Pisces II, at around 10.35 am. News would spread that this had happened, which meant that more ships started moving to the location to offer assistance. For instance, the Royal Navy survey vessel HMS Hecate came to help with special ropes at around 12.09. The United States Navy would offer a submersible belonging to the US Salvage Department, which is called the Curve 3, which was designed to pick up bombs from the sea. And the Canadian Coast Guard ship John Cabot would immediately leave from Swansea. And a maritime patrol aircraft known as the RAF Nimrod would also fly overhead. The Pisces II and the Pisces V had been picked up by aircraft and arrived overnight in Cork. So the mothership, Wicker's Voyager, immediately headed to Cork to load the submersibles onto the ship. The ship arrived at around 8 and then left Cork at around 10.30 and would arrive back at the scene on Friday, the 31st of August at around 2 a.m. While all of this was going on on the surface, the men in the submersible had almost run out of supplies. And at this point, they were lethargic and drowsy due to the buildup of the carbon dioxide in the air, which was something that they had done intentionally to conserve as much oxygen as they possibly could. Chapman and Mallison were fortunately still able to communicate with the ship on the surface. But the more time that passed, and they were stuck in the submersible with nothing happening, the more the doubts started creeping up. Both men found themselves thinking more and more about their families. Roger Chapman had recently gotten married 
and he spent his time thinking about his wife. Roger Mallison had a wife as well as four young children, and he would find himself getting distressed thinking about his children. But the two men would spend this time looking out for each other, making sure that the other was okay, which Mallison would later credit as a big reason for why they survived. At this point, they still had to keep calm and wait. Now there was a bit of a problem on the surface. The Pisces II was launched with a polypropylene rope attached, but this broke free of the manipulator arm, and the submersible was forced to return to the surface to be repaired. They also had to locate the Pisces III, as they weren't sure where the submersible was at that point. So Pisces V was sent down with a polypropylene line attached to a toggle to try to locate the crashed submersible. The Pisces V would only return to the surface after it had almost depleted its entire power supply. The Pisces V would launch a second time. This time, they were successful. At around 12.44 pm, the Pisces V would locate the Pisces III, and the sight of this submersible gave renewed hope to the trapped crew. On the surface, they then tried to launch Pisces II, but the submersible sprung a leak, so they had to abort that attempt. They also planned to launch the Curve 3, but that submersible had suffered an electrical fault, which kept it from launching. Down at the bottom, Pisces V was trying to attach a snap hook to the other submersible, but this failed. However, even though this attempt failed, the Pisces V remained with the down submersible until it was ordered to return to the surface, which was just after midnight. The Pisces V leaving meant that the crew was alone in complete darkness once again. And by now, despite the men's best efforts to conserve as much oxygen as possible, it was running out. They were also running out of lithium hydroxide, which was used to scrub the carbon dioxide from the deteriorating atmosphere in the submersible. Both men were now freezing, soaked completely through, and also suffering from severe headaches. But one of the only things that managed to keep the men's spirits up was dolphins. They had seen the dolphins before while working, but they obviously couldn't see them now in complete darkness but they could hear them on the underwater telephone. They were able to hear the dolphins the entire time they were down there. Early on Saturday, the 1st of September, rescue operations was launched in earnest, with Pisces II going down with a specially designed toggle and another polypropylene line. Little over an hour later, it had successfully attached a tow rope to the rear sphere of Pisces III. The Curb III would also join this operation, and at around 10.30 am, another tow rope was attached to the stranded submersible. At this point, knowing that they were now attached to two submersibles, the crew of the Pisces III decided to consume their last remaining food and drink. Despite this, the men also had a lot of doubts that they would actually get to the surface. In fact, Mallison have said in later interviews that at that point, both men were so doubtful that this would even work, that if someone had asked them if they wanted to be left or lifted, both men would have told the surface crew to just leave them at the bottom. At 10.50 am, the procedure of lifting Pisces III to the surface began. As soon as it got off the seabed, it was a bumpy ride which further disoriented the men inside the sub. In fact, during the ride up, the submersible was constantly trashing about, which led to the lift being stopped twice. The first was when they had reached a depth of 350 feet, because the Curve 3 needed to be disentangled. The second time was when they had reached 100 feet. This time, that was done so that divers could dive down and attach heavier lift lines to the submersible. At 1.17 pm, September 1st, 1973, Pisces 3 broke through the surface. 
divers would immediately go over and try to open the hatch to allow some fresh air into the sub. But the hatch had been jammed shut and it wouldn't open upside down. So it would take almost 30 minutes before the divers were able to get it open. When the hatch opened, the combination of fresh air and sunlight would give Mallison and Chapman blinding headaches. They also would struggle to get out of the submersible after having been confined inside this tight space for such a long time. But none of that mattered. They were absolutely elated that they had been rescued. All in all, the men had been inside the submersible a total of 84 hours and 30 minutes. When they checked the oxygen supply, they realized that they only had 12 minutes of oxygen left, meaning that the rescue of Chapman and Mallison was literally in the nick of time. Only 15 minutes later, and this would have been a very different story. In 1975, Roger Chapman would publish an account of his rescue in his book titled No Time on Our Side. In 1984, he would leave the company Wickers and start his own submarine company, Rumik. This company would provide subsea services and operations to the offshore and defense industries. One example of this is when a Rumik submersible, which was called the Scorpio 45, was used to rescue the Russian deep submergence rescue vehicle AS-28 in 2005. Chapman was appointed the CBE in 2006 for his services to shipping. He sold his company in 2002 and founded a children's charity alongside his wife. Roger Mallison would continue on working for the same company in submersibles until 1978. After that, he would become involved in restoring steam engines and earned a Lifetime Achievement Award from Prince Michael of Kent for his involvement with the Chamrock Trust in Windermere 2013. Chapman and Mallison would keep in touch over the years and they would meet up every year. Roger Chapman passed away from cancer in 2020 at the age of 74. In 2023, while searches for the submersible known as Titan was still underway, the then 85-year-old Roger Mallison was interviewed about the incident, where he expressed concern that there was a lack of any kind of signal and he felt that this meant that something horrible must have happened. Which, with hindsight, we know is true. The submersible known as Titan would implode on the 18th of June 2023. A very different ending than the one that Mallison and Chapman experienced in 1973. Titan and Oceangate has been heavily criticized for many of the decisions they made regarding the submersible. Some criticism has been labeled at the company Wickers Oceanics, which owned the Pisces 3. As I mentioned in the beginning, the Pisces 3 originally had tail fins, which was removed to improve access and handling. After the accident, many theorized that if the submersible still had those tail fins, they might have prevented the entanglement of the tow line, which is what ended up causing the accident in the first place. It's nowhere near the cut corners of Ocean Gate and Titan, but it's still something to think about. One simple decision may have been the thing that could have prevented the entire accident in the first place. But this is just speculation as we will never know. What we do know though is that this story did have a good ending. What I found myself stuck on is only 12 minutes of oxygen remaining. There really was no room for error at that point. It's an amazing story. And to this day, the rescue of Roger Mallison and Roger Chapman still holds the record for the deepest sea rescue in history. <laughs>